All right, hey, how's it going, everybody? This is Greg Brown from Foundry, and we are restarting the stream from scratch again. Sorry about all the problems, but we ran into a, um, a, 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 a well, a completely failed encoding of the video of this recording, which was awesome. And so we had to scramble around a little bit and uh, figure out a way to get this running, considering we didn't have 30 minutes to re-export it again. So right now it's actually um, running full screen in uh, Premiere, which is kind of interesting. If you want to know how to do that, I just found out how to do that about five minutes ago. So uh, yeah, I'll tell you about it later. Uh, it's kind of cool. Um, you can actually set a second monitor to be your display device, which is super useful. So sorry about the problems there. Uh, we'll just start it here from scratch again. And uh, as you can see, uh, we have this alligator snapping turtle um, that is displaying as a turntable right now. And this is a project I've been working on in Canova. And the last stream actually uh, was the first half of you know producing this model and uh, starts off in VR, moves over to desktop because there are advantages in working in both desktop and in VR and being able to switch back and forth, which of course is one of the big aspects um, of Canova because we wanted to make sure people could leverage the advantages of both. So we kind of have a special stream here today. Um, we are uh, we have Vilja Harvey, um, a developer for Canova, here to talk with us about his Hi, experience everyone. developing. How's it going, Bill? <laughs> yeah, good, Greg. Yeah, glad to have got the um, the teething troubles out of the way. I <laughs> hope so. I, I seem to have trouble with every single one. It's always something new that that screws up. But yeah, I thought the encoding was good and. Uh, no, um, uh, it disagreed with me on that, uh, but oh well, that's that's computers. And we also, of course, have Ed again with us uh, here today. How's it going, Ed? Pretty good. Hi, guys. All right. And so as you can see, I am working through the process of detailing um, this snapping turtle. Um, the desktop portions are running at 300% um, speed and the... Uh, or, Desktop portions running at 600% speed, while the VR uh, portions are running at 300% speed up because uh, uh, I don't think most people can tolerate watching um, uh, <laughs> VR through a headset at 600% speed up. It's it's nauseating for me, and I spend a lot of time in VR. You guys would hate it. Uh, so um, as you can see, I'm able to work on this model in really interesting ways. The second portion is really organized around detailing and showing you the process of detailing. Um, now, Canova is still in its early stages of development. We have lots of cool features we want to add, and we're even going to talk about that a little bit at the end of this webinar. Uh, we have a new kit bashing preview we want to show you because we have been working on kit bashing tools for Canova because um, I think it's pretty obvious it would be hugely useful. Uh, but in this case, I'm sculpting everything. Um, and uh, while that's challenging, it's a great test for the application to see how well it's performing, especially as complex complexity increases. And this is the first model that I worked on where I was like, yeah, I can really, really make something substantial now. And, uh, you know, that's because of all the hard work Bill has been doing over the past months. Um, if you remember, uh, Canova came out in April. Um, and since then, it has increased in performance and capabilities dramatically. And so, you know, I've got to ask you, Bill, uh, what's your background? Because uh, you've done an amazing job working on Canova so far. And, uh, what, you know, what is your background here at Foundry and in general? Um, so I've, uh, I've spent a long time working on 3D stuff, um, not specifically digital sculpting, but uh, um, yeah, until uh, until Canova. But, uh, but yeah, lots of 3D stuff in general. Um, I've been at the Foundry for a very long time now, so I've, you know, I've, tried, uh, I've done stints in a few of the different teams. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, always been a bit of a 3D guy. Awesome. Nice. And so yeah. you're, uh, you're part of our, uh, our so-called, I'm, I'm doing, you know, finger quotes right now, uh, <laughs> our Skunk Works team? Yeah, that's right. There's a, this is a small team that, that does the more, um, well, yeah, projects like Canova. Uh, yeah, there's slightly more out there stuff that's, um, yeah, that, that's not, uh, well, not, not yet anyway, the Foundry's bread and butter. Thank you so much for doing that too, because I mean, uh, like anybody who uh, has been using Modo in the past couple of years, I've been super excited to see us work on ADF or utilizing ADF technology. Um, and so, you know, if we get lots of questions on the forums, like, you know, are you even working on this? Well, I think Canova is an interesting example in, in, of, you know, how some of the things we kind of may show off from time to time or that you may want us to be working on. Uh, frequently, we are working on these things behind the scenes and trying to see how viable they are. And as you can see, 
Canova um, using ADF technology for sculpting um, did turn out to be very viable. Challenging technology, but very viable. Um, what, what is what is your opinion of of ADF technology, Bill? Um, yeah, yeah it's a, I think there's a lot of potential in it. Um, and I think we're, we're starting to, to realize some of that. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, there's still plenty more that we can do with it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's uh, that there's still a, a bit of a road ahead. Um, but, but yeah, I'm already pretty uh, pretty excited with where we've got to, and um, and like, like you were saying, yeah, yeah, it's it's at the point now where you can actually, you can start to do uh, some uh, some pretty good uh, things with it. Yeah, and to give you guys a, an example, uh, um, at the end when we talk about the kit bashing preview, um, Bill has been working on some of these cool features recently, and uh, we were having a talk this morning, weren't happy with every single thing, and he pushed a new build live uh, an hour ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, wearing my cowboy hat. Yeah, so I was just like, wow. Like, take a bow, dude. Take a bow. And, like, the little issues, I was like, oh, this isn't working great. And all of a sudden, there it is fixed. And um, that, that's, I think that kind of transcends the experience of working with you. Uh, <laughs> you always seem to deliver incredible stuff incredibly fast. Um, is this challenging technology to work with? I mean, you said your background is in 3D. Um, what's unique about this, and are there any unique challenges? Um, yeah, so, well, one of the big things has just been the amount of data it generates. Uh, yeah. You, know, you end up with a, a if you end up with a mesh that's got like you know a few hundred thousand triangles in it, then chances are there's a few you know that the ADF has like a few million nodes in it, um, and that can end up being a lot of data, and uh, just yeah dealing with that that quantity of stuff and keeping the performance up and uh, it has you know that that's definitely been one of the challenges. Um, yeah, we've been finding ways to deal with that, and and, and uh, yeah, again, there's still more we can do, uh, but. Uh, but, but yeah, that's uh, that's been part of it. And I, I think, think yeah, part of that's because it's a volumetric representation and uh, rather than just a surface representation like a triangle mesh. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. You know, one of the ways I like to explain like three D modeling to people who especially aren't familiar with it is that it, it's you know typical three D modeling with polygons and sub subdivision surfaces and applications like Modo. You know, it, I almost want to confuse them from the start and say it's not really three D, um, and it's just to change their perspective on it where. Um, it's like my opinion of sub-D modeling is that you're actually stretching 2D surfaces in a 3D world. You know, it's not like you actually have like these these structures where um, all the data of the volume is 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 present. And is that is that you know one of the things about what causes so much data in Canova? Yeah, yeah, and it's also um, it's just the the nature of the ADF is that uh, you know to to cope with. Um, Things that are at an angle, for example, you, know, you, you need to uh, subdivide it quite heavily. Uh, so, you know, there, there are things it's not as good at uh, as triangles, but then there are other things it does a whole lot better. And one of the th one of those things is, you know, it helps avoid the kind of the technical knowledge that you need to, uh, when you're modeling with triangles. Uh, yeah, you, know, you can just create, uh, and and that's certainly what we're going for with Canova. Jeez, and I just uh, I crashed Premiere. What a shock! <laughs> that never ever happens. And premiere ever and so let me go ahead and get this running again sorry about the problems guys wish this had actually come out correctly um, so, which it didn't so Bill I have, I have kind of like a, like a silly question uh, when you say nodes like uh, the ADF nodes what exactly what exactly are they are they like the little tiny uh, cubes is it is it something that you can visualize in the viewport or is it more of an abstraction uh, is it more of an abstract idea like you know, when you're when you're looking at like a volume, you see like the little cubes sometimes, the little wireframe cubes that kind of make up the form or the volume. Yeah, it's exactly that. So the um, the the ADF is is stored in a it, well, uh, in a, a tree structure. So you get you know the the hierarchy of uh, of the little cubes, um, and then we store you know, data within those cubes to describe uh, you know how far how, how far that is from the surface. Oh, I see. Okay. And uh, and then uh, yeah then. Yeah, whenever you do an edit, um, we uh, we run code over that to generate triangles from it, um, and then it's the triangles that we display. So, is it a challenge to find out like exactly where to to create the surface of triangles uh, from the from the nodes from the ADF nodes? Is, there, is that um, part of the? There, there are some some challenges around that, but uh, there's you know, there's a few fairly well known algorithms for it as well. Um, and we're, we're not doing anything too revolutionary there. We're, we're using um, well-known algorithms for it. Um, 
and uh, you know they, they make use of the structure of the tree so they can avoid doing you know, w work in areas where there's no where there's not going to be any geometry uh, and that helps keep the performance up so you know that's an important aspect of, uh, of you know, being able to create the larger models oh cool yeah, and it was kind of amazing seeing you work through like reducing the amount of data that was being saved um, early on. Uh, it was something that Ed and I both uh, were kind of amazed by because some of our early models uh, that we were working on were coming out at like four gigabytes. <laughs> and, like, I mean, <laughs> you had to make a change in the code to actually uh, say, no, yeah, you really do create models this big because Canova's like, I'm not going to load this. This isn't a real file, you know, because um, it's so much data. The files are so big, they broke Canova. <laughs> 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 but it, it, it didn't believe that files that large existed. At exactly. <laughs> but <laughs> it was interesting because over a, a couple releases, you went from uh, like, you know, like took a, a file that was like four, four gigabytes going down to like 400 megabytes or even less. I think it was like four gigabytes down to 250 megabytes. So over like a, a, a tenfold decrease in memory or in, in actually uh, um, file uh, size actually for saving the file and also decreases in memory usage. Uh, in general, uh, it was really, really impressive seeing that 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 happen. But I mean, that that's got to be one of the nightmare aspects here, is because uh, managing that kind of data um, in a standard three D application is, I mean, it's pretty well established now. But with this type of, uh, you know, the, the volumetric data, that's not something that is as readily available, is it? The information about how to conserve memory in those types of situations. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there's. There, there are different ways to store it, but um, I think part of the problem was that you know originally the the, the code we had was just it was being a bit wasteful. Mm -hmm. So you know it was just it was a case of tightening that up and um, yeah not not uh, storing data that we can uh, re reconstruct easily. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, another aspect of it is the way that we uh, that we represent the ADF. Um, you know there, there are other ways to represent it that might take less memory, but you know, they might be a bit slower for editing and, and so on. And uh, you know, or, or or a bit slower for loading or, or something like that. So it's a balancing act as well, and um, you know we're just trying to find uh, trying to find the right trade off. Fair enough. All right. No, it's it's definitely been pretty amazing watching you work through it. Uh, now, one thing that's worth bringing up uh, in, in this section of the video is sculpt feel. Um, like you know, like I've said, it would be great to have some additional features for kit bashing and things of that sort. It'd be easier to produce forms like this. Um, but one thing that's worth articulating is I wouldn't be able to create these forms that are kind of semi hard surface but slightly organic forms well unless the application had a good feel to it. And we talked, uh, you know, early on in development quite a lot about feel. And, uh, you know, it's something that you did an incredibly good job at. And I'm always very anxious about saying because I'm like, oh, my God, am I going to just tell this guy it doesn't feel right? You know, like that's, that's got to be an incredibly annoying thing to hear. Um, but you nailed it. It really, I mean, it really has an excellent feel, especially considering that it's not doing what standard sculpting applications do because standard sculpting applications deform a surface. In the case of Canova, at all times with every stroke, you're replacing the surface and it's being regenerated in that area. Well, yeah, I, I can only take a bit of the credit for that because part of the credit goes to the um, the, the developer of the like there was an original prototype mm -hmm. that this was based on. Mm -hmm. um, so some you know some of that uh, is uh, some of his code is still left in it. Gotcha. And, um, so yeah, that, that that's um, yeah, like I say, I, you know, it's, it's not just me. <laughs> okay, uh, fair enough. Um, I'm responsible for that, but. Uh, yeah, it's a nice thing to hear, though. Thanks. No, it you're is. Being well, too, yeah. You're being too nice, Bill. You got to take credit for everything. I really do. Know. Yes, <laughs> and the 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 person who did the the test code for us, um, I mean, he did do an incredible job of of kind of proving that this was viable, and uh, uh, you know, definitely did you know spend a lot of time on field. But I mean, having used that application at the time, and having used this, you know, uh, since this this newer project or version of it uh, started up, uh, you, it, I mean, Ed, you can speak to this because you were using it. This not this past summer, but the summer before, um, f the feel has improved dramatically. So I don't know. What do you think, Ed? Oh yeah, the, the, there's definitely been uh, just a steady trajectory of things getting smoother yeah. and just more streamlined. It's uh, it's come a long way for sure. It really has. It's just it's becoming faster to sculpt um, and just more and more refined. 
absolutely no and uh that's the goal right we want to keep it you know keep keep on getting faster and uh, and, and better to use and everything so what do you think uh i mean it, it's a it's a weird question to ask you know because it's something that you almost can't even answer because it's it's very unpredictable but uh do you feel like this technology can go much further as far as detail precision and performance do you think there's there's room for that yeah yeah i definitely do um you know, we've got a lot of ideas still that we still haven't tried out, you know, as far as uh, the performance goes. Um, yeah, there's, uh, and as far as detail goes, uh, yeah, there, there's, well, it, it's it, because it's, uh, you know, an, an adaptive and hierarchical structure. In theory, there's, you know, we, we can, uh, uh, there's no limit to how much you can create. Uh, yeah, in practice, there are, you know, there are limits, like, you know, you run out of memory or um, you, you run up against uh, floating point precision issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think there's, you know, there's a long way that we can go before we hit those limits. That is super awesome to hear. And I mean, you know, the, the thing is like, just to emphasize this to artists watching this stream, I mean, anybody who's worked as an artist understands the notion of like, you know, you, you have a certain time limit on a project that you can spend and you get, you know, two, three days away from that, that being over with, and you just have to decide from that point forward, how do I complete this by that date and achieve as much as possible? And that's something that you've run into um, all the time, Bill. And that's got to be super frustrating because we always have cool ideas and you always have some brilliant you know, solution that you want to explore. But, you know, we have to make we have to make a sculpting application. We have to make something that is actually functional and, uh, <laughs> you know, like and not just toy around with things. But it's it's it, it, c coming from being an artist and then working for a software company. It's like. I've definitely made posts in my past, uh, past on forums that I terribly regret now <laughs> because the conversations that go on behind the scenes, it's, it's conversations between a, a lot of people who love this technology. And you're one of those people who loves technology like this. And we've got lots of ideas about where we want to take this. But then at the same time, we also have to step back and be responsible and say, okay, well, how are we going to actually finish this into, into something that can, we can actually reasonably release to the public that, that that's got to be uh, one of the more frustrating challenges. Cause you always seem to have some new brilliant idea you want to pursue. Well, yeah, and uh, and you keep coming up with uh, with good ideas too, actually. Right, you know, and actually, it's worth it's worth throwing out <laughs> there the, the, the the beta <laughs> testers that you know we've had behind the scenes um, have been extremely helpful with that too. Dino has been amazing. You know, Moto users, you're probably familiar yeah, with them. Dino Zanko uh, does. You know, he's he's he's, he's, he's actually he's not a sculptor. He hasn't sculpted many things. He's done some really cool things with reproducing meshes using a uh, background mesh that's imported and then kind of filling it in manually with the brush. Um, but he is incredibly good at isolating problems and, and making them reproducible. Uh, and he's had lots of ideas he's contributed. And it's almost frustrating hearing all these guys, um, you know, suggest things because it's like, yeah, no, we totally hear you. We just can't, can't do that right now. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta make this, make this all work. So I gotta say that that's been the, the most frustrating part of, of developing Canova is, is just having so many cool things that we could be doing. Oh yeah, exactly. And not enough time to do them in. Well, that's uh, just it. Is like I, you know, I, I've I've said it before, and I, I almost don't want to um, uh, say too much about it, but. You know, we, we frequently um, look at technology like this and see how it can be applied elsewhere and uh, or more broadly. And ADF, I think anybody who has any experience with 3D can see the potential for, I mean, just amazing modeling and sculpting tools in the future. Um, one of the things that I've, I'm, I'm very good with sub-Ds. I'm excellent with topology. And now that's, you know, me praising myself, which is definitely not very cool, but it's true. I'm good at these things. Um, a lot of people aren't, and it's frustrating having to learn the technical aspects of being a modeler um, or a sculptor. And because um, it's still very technical and ADF has the potential um, maybe to, to redefine what's necessary. Just be an artist. My background was in sculpture before I came to 3D. And all I wanted was a piece of clay on the screen that I could sculpt with. And very quickly I realized, no, that's not gonna happen. You know, you need to you need to learn a little bit about this technology and learn about the techniques behind it and really learn how to exploit it. And ADF seems like it is the first time I've used an application where I'm like, this has the potential to be, um, you know, what I thought a 3D application was 15 years ago. Just produce your forms, refine those forms. 
And maybe it still has to be pass, passed on to uh, somebody later on down the line for technical aspects like topology and stuff like that. But anybody can pick Canova up, figure out what these tools do quickly and easily, work with the object in front of them in real world scale, or sit down at their desktop and work with the tablet or mouse. And I think that um, there's a lot we can exploit as far as the way that models are created and, uh, and the technical capabilities that are necessary to create those uh, for sculpting and modeling in general um, over the coming years. I think this has so much potential. Uh, by the way, right now I've been working in VR because uh, the, the, I don't know, the, what do you call, like, are they turtle feet? I bet you it has a specific name. Like, <laughs> it's probably got it, like, some crazy <laughs> flippers. For they, for, kind of I'll bet for like for aquatic turtles, it's probably flippers. Baby. Probably. I don't know. Uh, well, aren't all turtles amphibians though? So I mean, he, this uh, guy's got yeah. webbed toes. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, okay, we'll we'll call him his, his turtle his toes have last week, flipper too. feet. Yeah, <laughs> flippy. Uh, but yeah, uh, I was actually doing that in VR because it was much easier to rough out those large forms in VR, and even um, around the neck when I was starting to to make that kind of a little bit more bulgy and starting to get the shape of the um, the actual wrinkles that are in around the neck. It was a lot easier to do that in VR. And uh, again, with Canova, you can have your headset sitting next to you. You can be working on desktop, and then you can decide, you know what, I, I, I want to be in VR for now. Throw the headset on, use the wands, take the headset off, go back to the desktop. And I mean, I love that because um, one of the things that, I mean, just to be frank about VR, that drives me nuts is the level of commitment of putting on a headset. And you're there, you're doing this for now. And the fact that I can just take it off and continue working the way that I, I'm used to in the past is to me uh, one, of the, uh, one, of the, the, one of the greatest aspects uh, as far as functionality and workflow is concerned for Canova. Uh, Ellery says that they're called uh, fleepers. Fleepers? Oh, thank yeah. you for the technical <laughs> term. I appreciate that, <laughs> and, Ellery. <laughs> and all I know is that uh, the, the neck is called a turtleneck. That's all. That's the only help I'm going to be. <laughs> okay. Uh, although, all right. Greg Greg Lewenberger is in the uh, chat. And oh, no. He, he knows, the, doesn't uh, he? Yeah, he, he does a lot of like aquatic and uh, uh, type of creatures for like the uh, the Monterey Aquarium. So maybe he can answer. He did have a couple of questions. We have a few uh, audience questions. I don't yeah, know please. If wanna... Go for them. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um. Greg was asking if uh, the RTX cores in the new NVIDIA cards might be useful uh, in any way to Canova. Um, yeah, obviously we don't have support for them yet because uh, we didn't even uh, know that they were uh, were a thing until uh, until the announcement uh, a week or so back. Um, but uh, but yeah, yeah, looking forward. There's a lot we could do with them. Um, ADFs are a structure that works well with ray tracing, so uh, uh, yeah, it, it is something I'd really like to investigate. There is actually, if you if you guys uh, uh, take a look there, there is that underneath the debug menu now? There was a, a ray trace output at one point where you could get like a render of ray trace, which is super cool. But one thing we got to be very clear on is um, we can't commit to any features uh, like that. Um, that technology is super exciting. Um, but you know, right now we are you know, we are working on uh, ADS on the CPU currently. And uh, but man, that is exciting stuff uh, from Nvidia. That was like. That was that was a gigantic mic drop for for SIGGRAPH. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was then, uh, as a graphics guy, I've dreamed of for the you know for the last twenty years. Uh, you know, ray tracing becoming real time and you know, uh -huh. support and everything. It's uh, you know it's funny. <laughs> it's it's like uh, it, it's it is amazing, and people who are involved in in industries related to this you can look at that and say like that's incredible. But I was also looking at like lots of gamers reactions and they're like, well, it doesn't look that much better. I'm like, no, no, you're completely wrong. This looks absolutely amazing. <laughs> and the technology behind what's going on is incredible too. But it, it did also, you know, reemphasize to me how good of a job like real time game engines or how, how good they become through the years. Um, because like, for instance, the NVIDIA demos to make sure that people truly understood how cool it was, they had to make sure the lights were moving and stuff like that because baked shadows have become so common and so good. Um, mm -hmm that you know it's like we had to make sure they had to make sure people could see that like no this is you know this is real time lighting like real time shadows it's amazing and have having objects moving so you really see the reflections cascade over a surface and stuff like that um, but hopefully it's going to make in the future um you know uh creating assets a lot easier and actually creating content a lot easier at least that's what i'm, I'm hoping for 
Uh, we don't want yeah. to worry about, you know, all the nuances that are necessary, like two different UVs, one for light maps and one for textures and things of that sort, yeah. which can be so frustrating. And one of the reasons games look so good is that they can, you know, use tricks like closing off camera angles and uh, you know, things like hiding things um, just to avoid the corner cases where all the, the like the normal real time techniques fail. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the, th the great things about ray tracing is that it doesn't have a lot of those corner cases. Yeah, so I get pretty much everyone who's uh, who, who does graphics uh, hates shadow maps, for example. <laughs> and uh, you know, if we can get ray traced shadows, then we don't have to deal with shadow maps anymore, and that'll be fantastic. And so that that reduces basically it, it it opens up overhead for doing other things. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, yeah, and you know, like shadow maps, you're always having to worry about the you know, the resolution and then mm -hmm. using tricks to make sure that the uh, you know, um, yeah, you, you're using the detail where it's needed and not where it isn't and, and make so sure on. your UVs are actually good. So they actually look good. You know, like it's, it seems like you can, you can always find an issue that is in some way related to that in a game, you know, like people always find issues with textures stretching or a shadow map that doesn't look quite right. And it's like, well, that could be due to so many different aspects. Be nice to get that out of the, you know, uh, to a point where that's not part of production, which is interesting, you know, because early on in this uh, uh, this stream, we were kind of talking about um, how nice it would be for artists just to be artists in a way, right? You know, just mm -hmm. not have to be technical. And uh, that's a great example of it where it's like, look, why, you know, it'd be great to just be able to create a model, put it in a scene in a game engine and just have it look great. It's like, I made my textures, I've made my model, it's in there, but that's not, that's not the, that's, that's not what you have to focus on when you're creating assets. You have to make sure all these other peripheral elements, like your UVs, like your vertex maps, all this stuff is just perfect to make sure it looks right in the game. And it would, it would look, be awesome if you don't have to worry about that anymore. You just focus your time on making a beautiful high quality asset. Yeah, yeah, it, it agreed, and and I think that's yeah you know, that's the real promise of the these ray tracing graphics cards is that you know, they can make all that so much easier. I can't wait to see how the the coming generations uh, you know develop because you know this is the first generation of these cards and it's incredible, but it's like you know now it's out there in the wild. You know, uh, I think it's going to be you know interesting seeing the next couple more generations. Uh, that come after this and how they step it up. Like one of my favorite video cards, I love video cards, uh, was the GTX 480. That was a great card from NVIDIA. It was a big step up in performance. Um, and, uh, you know, like I, 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 but then, you know, if you if you step on through, down the line and you go up to like the 780, all of a sudden the 480 just looks like a joke, you know, uh, three generations later. And now, you know, like uh, it was interesting with VR, like I had a Titan X, like which is a, a 980 on steroids, great card. But then the 10 series came out and VR started to become popular. And it's like, well, it couldn't, that 980, that Titan X really isn't all that great anymore. The 1080 absolutely killed it. And so I'm super curious what um, the later iterations of this tech is going to look like, what we're going to get from that. Yeah, I, I'm also keen to see uh, you know, what, what AMD's response is going to be. I know, I've been dying to see that. Cause I mean, well, I mean, they're interesting right now, aren't they? I mean, if like I, I get alerts on on their on on their stock actually, and there's all sorts of talk online about uh, just you know how how great they're doing right now. Apparently, they're an excellent stock purchase is the claim, um, but their their new CPUs are just so good. Their Threadripper um, CPUs are just absolutely amazing. One I have one sitting right next to me right now. Sorry, Ellery, you sent that to me. I had to use it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, it's incredible seeing what they've done. And so, yeah, what is AMD going, AMD going to do, um, uh, you know, uh, in response to that, we know it's gotta be coming eventually. Hey, we've got a couple, uh, more questions. Uh, Go for there, it. are there, f are there future plans to import a mesh from Moto and have it convert to ADF? In Canova. Yes, there is. Um, we'll go ahead and say that. We've said it before, so it's okay for us to say that. Cool. Um, the example we're going to show um, later on today, uh, later at the end of this webinar, very briefly, I just wanted to show a, a very, very small example of it, um, is meshes that are created in Canova can, or a layer that's created in Canova can be turned into a custom brush. And then that custom brush could be selected and applied to a surface. Um, so uh, that's our first step, um, but uh, we will be supporting imports uh, of meshes later. Um, so, Bill, that is um, that's a challenge, correct? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it can be tricky because you know, meshes often have uh, you know they'll have holes in or, or things like that. 
Um, and yeah, that, there are ways to deal with that. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's like I was saying before. Yeah, we've got a million and one things to do. So yeah, uh, it is high on the uh, list, but it's not the immediate one. The yeah, we're we're trying to make sure the kit bashing workflow really works and that's reliable, and then we can kind of go back and take a look at import of these meshes. Are there are there are there different challenges between hard surface forms and organic forms, Bill? Um, well, from my point of view, not not really. It's all just huh? yeah. So just triangle meshes. Okay. <laughs> but I, I guess one of the problems is, yeah, with the ADF resolution is it's it's not as good as a triangle mesh at representing sharp edges. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that, um, in turning those into a uh, into an ADF without losing you know, too much of the detail is uh, is something that we have to be careful of. Um, but uh, beyond that, um, uh, yes, yeah, so it's kind of much the same. Okay, well, that's that's actually really good to hear. And you can see right now what I'm doing is uh, like this is like like playing around with these like kind of scale forms that are on the head was something where that I really enjoyed uh, on this model uh, because I it, it's I, I didn't even have to think about like did I did I actually add enough resolution in the base mesh for the head that allows me to actually go in there and add these scales at this at whatever the given level is. I was able to just go in there and just start sculpting them and zoom in closer and closer and actually make like make it look, really look like the scales are overlapping on top of the horns, uh, which I was super excited about because I mean these are the things that if you work on a sculpt um, you know for a long time work on like, an asset for a long time, I mean you're 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 just scared of getting to the end of it because you wonder like did I set everything up correctly so that I can actually get all the detail I want out of it. And that's something that is just at, in, in Canova, you know, is an afterthought because like you can just increase resolution by zooming in. And I thought that was super exciting and super fun. Are there any other questions, Ed? Uh, yeah. Uh, so James Morgan wanted to know, uh, have we implemented a form of scale or units in Canova? Um, everything is in meters um but by default, uh, we, we don't have any way to change that to something else yet. Yeah, and uh, also to kind of add to that, if if uh, if you want to make sure your asset comes in and comes out exactly the same size, um, that is something that we are looking into. It is again slightly on the lower priority side. Um, if you import an OBJ as a reference mesh into Canova, um, it is going to import within the late one meter by one meter bounds. That is the um, actual asset. Uh, you know, are the the volumetric space that you can sculpt in, and one thing to make sure your stuff comes in at exactly the same scale for now that you can do is create a layer. Um, say, for instance, if you're doing this in Modo, create a layer that is just a one meter, you know, cube, and uh, separate all the faces, scale down all the faces individually so they're really tiny. But that means that it is fully filling up the space, and that can be on a separate layer. And it export that with the mesh that you're bringing in to Canova, and that means that it will sit within the same boundary space. And so uh, in the example, I'm going to show you, you guys with uh, um, the kit bashing preview. That's what I did for now. That is something we want to add more precision. Um, but currently with some of the other things that we're working on, uh, it's slightly on the uh, slightly lower on the priority list. And then there was one question, Greg, this might be for you. Uh, what, somebody asked, what is the process for if you have a highly detailed sculpt, but then want to reposition, for example, the leg of the character? Uh, well, I mean, that would that would depend. Uh, it depends upon whether or not the leg is a completely different layer. Uh, if it's on, if it's all a single mesh on the same layer, really, there there really isn't a way to do that for now. It's something that we we talked about. I want to add. It's another later feature, um, but you can't necessarily deform, uh, you know, an entire region of the mesh yet. Uh, but you know, it's another one of those things on that list, right, Phil? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think. Um... Uh, it, it, you know, I, I can be honest here and say that we we have uh, a move tool button there, but it's uh, it's broken at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that that one yes. is high on the priority list. The actual move brush, um, you know, a, a whole leg on a character might be a little bit more challenging to move, even if we had a move brush. Um, but that that move brush for you know at least you know kind of deforming smaller areas of the mesh that is on on the shorter list as far as things that we want to change. Uh, but that's that's an interesting one to even talk about just briefly. So. A mood brush. This is something that uh, to artists familiar with sculpting applications usually are like, yeah, that's that's definitely a, a tool that is absolutely necessary. Um, but it seems like every volumetric uh, sculpting tool that's ever come out has been like, yeah, this is really hard. What's so hard about that? <laughs> uh, well, it's 
it, it, it's with, with um, triangles. You know, you can just you, you can move the vertices, uh, and you know, and the surface moves. Um, with the with a volumetric representation, you you have to move well not just the surface but the the interior as well. And uh, because of the way we sample the the volume, you know, it's it's um you know it's in these axis lined cubes. So. Uh, if you're changing the orientation, then you need to resample the surface, and you need to try try and uh, do that without losing detail. Um, and uh, yeah, that that can be a little tricky. Um, there you go. So uh, so yeah, it's it, it's it's to do with that really, and and also uh, making it perform well enough to be usable. <laughs> it, it's a, it can be a lot of data to ship around. There you go. Okay, fair enough. And I mean, have have any other tools talked about their experiences with 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 move brushes and and their their weird wacky solutions? They're usually not um, just a matter of refining how well the tool works, right? It's usually much more than that. Yeah. Well, there's been um, some blog posts uh, from from the, um, the the team working on Oculus Medium about how they implemented their move tool, mm -hmm. uh, and I have to say they've done a great job of it. Uh, it, it looks really good. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, uh, yeah, it shows it can be done. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, they have a slightly different rep uh, representation. Um, yeah, it's uh, not as complicated not as ours. Um, and uh, I, I suspect it's probably a bit simpler to implement with their their, their representation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't want to you know, bore everyone with. The, with the details. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. Well, I mean, they they did some interesting things where they actually they converted it back to a mesh, and then you're moving the mesh with almost like a classic move tool, right? And then convert that back into the volumetric structure. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. And I think that's, uh, you know, that, that's actually a really clever idea to do it that way. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's also, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, okay, so uh, we're back to cheating in CG again. So, you know, it's <laughs> kind of funny. Well, it's not really cheating. It's just, you know, it, <laughs> it's uh, you know, finding an easier way to do it because uh, it still does the right thing. Fair enough. Okay, I, I can totally accept that, but it, it's it, it's one of those things that I usually find funny. We always have to, even even as an artist working in three D, you always have to find a way around, a different way. It's usually not uh, not not as straight of a path as you'd like it to be. Uh, have they, you heard them saying that in computer graphics, everything is smoke and mirrors, except for smoke and mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have not heard that. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Somehow. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. That's awesome. Like, that's great. I'll have to remember that. Uh, any other any other questions, Ed? Uh, yeah. There there are a couple. Um, so Thomas Chang asked, uh, can we eventually bring in alphas for stamping in forms? I well I okay. Um, that that would be a future feature. Definitely one thought of. Um, uh, you know, without saying too much about. Uh, you know, future ideas. Yes, adding detail with detail brushes should be something that will happen in the future. Um, I don't know if alphas are necessarily the right way to go. Uh, you know, because the thing about like we've we've talked about this in regards to other sculpting applications. Um, and well, okay, so we, we shouldn't always do things exactly the same way in Canova as we uh, as things are done in other sculpting applications that just have polygon surfaces in them. And alpha is a great way to do things when you're working with a polygon mesh, right? Um, it's a 2D representation of um, a 3D surface after that 3D surface is extruded or deformed, right? Um, but we're dealing with large 3D forms that can be um, like almost injected onto the surface. It's new geometry that's being added on but then blended in. And so I don't know if alphas specifically um, would be the best way to go in the future. It might be, who knows, but we need to, well, that's something that we will, you know, definitely be looking into in the future. But it might be as simple as, as the actual 3D geometry representation, but treat it as a brush, right? Because, you know, you really needed to have uh, an alpha um, just the way that sculpting applications have worked in the past. But with this kind of technology, maybe there are other ways where you're, you are actually using real geometry and that potentially could include things like undercuts and things of that sort and have additional advantages and not just, um, you know, a, um, a linear um, extrusion from the surface that you'd find with an alpha. I think that that could be useful too, though. Like, you know, yeah, uh, being able to use height maps as as stamps, sure. for example, as a you know, as well as um, you know, the, the ability to bring in three D shapes and use them as stamps. Totally, yeah, and like kind of be able to ease it in and kind of refine it. But it's one of those things where, uh, in talking about like brushes for Canova, like uh, in some of the early webinars, some people have asked, and in some of the earlier threads, asked about you know, like, well, it needs a brush system like other sculpting applications and. 
it's one of the things I want to emphasize about it. It's like it, need, it does need a brush system. It would be great to have a brush system with more controls, but maybe it shouldn't be like you know other brush systems that found in 3D apps or in 2D apps. It might it might be more than that, right? There's the, this is really cool technology that can do a lot of flexible things. And when you think about uh, the features that you may want added to it. Um, it does require a little bit more thinking outside the box, like not thinking about how it's done in another application, but thinking about the problem and then how it can be solved with new technology instead. And then there's been a lot of uh, questions about whether uh, Canova sculpting tech will make it into into motor, <laughs> but, they, yeah. but we kind of expected this. Yeah, and we'll say what we say every time, which is, uh, I mean, a very strong. Uh, I have no idea, no comment. Well, we're we're working on 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 ADF technology for Canova right now, um, and I mean, you know, uh, there is there is we aren't talking at all about bringing it into other applications, and I mean, you know, we've been publicly working on this since April. Um, you know, one thing to point out is when you're talking about it being a, a, a single feature in a very broad application like Modo, um, it doesn't get, uh, you know, this kind of attention and this kind of love that a person like Vil has given to it. This is a lot longer than a cycle would be used um, for, you know, an application like Modo and adding a new feature. And so um, regardless of what happens with this technology in the future, developing it as a standalone application is extremely advantageous because it gets the attention and refinement that it needs. And we've definitely got a long way to go um, adding and improving on this. So I think the right way to do that is, you know, through a standalone application and giving it that attention. And who knows what happens in the future from that point forward. Yeah, I, I think that what I'd add to that is that it's a lot easier to experiment in a, a small application like Canova huh. than it is in a large application with so much history like, like Modo. Uh, so this gives us a bit more freedom to try things out faster and to, you know, to, to iterate more. So uh, yeah, so we can uh, you know, we can find out what works and what doesn't, and uh, and yeah, then who, who knows what the, uh, what happens in the future? Yeah, yeah, and I mean this is not. Uh... This has not been a, a situation of Vil, you know, checking out a paper for some new cool idea and like, hey, let's just add this. This has been, you. I mean, this you've done a lot of a, a lot of experimentation. There's a reason why this was part of our skunk work, skunks work program. It wasn't just like, hey, this is a cool new thing somebody described in great detail. Let's add it to our application. It's like this is new technology. Let's see what we can do with this. Yeah, that's right. It's. Um... I mean, you know, the original ADF uh, idea goes back, um, that, that does go back a few years, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, finding the ways to work with it and make it performant enough for VR and, and everything, uh, yeah, that, that has involved a lot of uh, experimentation. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, yeah. yeah. So it's not, uh, uh, not been simple <laughs> necessarily, but, it's, but it has been a lot of fun. Fair enough. It's, it's interesting. It's like, you know, in just sculpting applications in general, uh, started really becoming more common commercially. Uh, you know, it's like it's not like there hadn't been sculpting applications made already. They just, you know, they really didn't satisfy all the needs, and it seems like people were experimenting with a lot of ideas on how to do it, and then it was done well. And now, I mean, you can find all these wacky sculpting applications all over the place. Like, I mean, like SculptGL, for instance, it's it's web based. I was able to run it on my Galaxy Note. You know, it was crazy, you know, it's like, but it's like, it's the nature of that technology where there was enough information on that type of sculpting that somebody was able to build something from that information. It was all very well established. This, not so much. Yeah, um, yeah that, it's, it's an interesting time, really, because, you know, computers have got a lot more powerful, graphics cards have got a lot more powerful, and, you know, we've all got a lot more memory now in, in them. So it, it gives us the freedom to try out things like this, which, uh, yeah, which uh, it, like might have been a bit too resource intensive a few years ago. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and really push them to see, you know, to try and create, you know, to, 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 you know, to see what we can do with them. Yeah, a good friend of mine uh, was just complaining about her computer, and uh, and so I was like, okay, so send me the specs, you know, like, and she just takes a, a a picture of the back of her computer with a sticker on it, and it's like Compact Six Thousand Pro. What is, oh boy, what is that? And so I go and look it up, and it's it's a, a, a an Intel Q ninety four hundred. And I'm like, oh my lord, your computer is ten years old. Like, you know, it's like, it's like, how much memory do you have? It's like four gigabytes of system memory. It's like, yeah, that's probably why your computer isn't running so great. But yeah, it's like, I mean, my system here, I've, I've, you know, it's it's essentially really a gaming system, and it's got 64 gigs of memory. It's not like that was cheap, but it also was very accessible. 
But, you know, I remember in the beginning, you know, learning 3D, those first couple of years, I think the first machine I, I started modeling on had like maybe, what was it? Uh, yeah, it had 16 megabytes of RAM. Um, my father got me an upgrade to 48 megabytes because I wanted to run Half-Life 1. And uh, <laughs> in a second, because Half-Life 1 was able to run, but not smoothly, unless it had, uh, it had 48 megabytes. I think it required 32. Um, but yeah, it's like it's gone so far. And, uh, you know, when we were stuck on 32-bit, even though the memory uh, uh, sizes were increasing, um, you know, doing renders with only 2 gigabytes or 4 gigabytes of memory was just absolutely awful. I mean, it was such a challenge to fit it all in there. Now we have oodles and oodles of memory and now we can experiment with wacky things like this that will gobble all that memory up i'm glad uh glad you're making an application that can actually use my whole computer <laughs> <laughs> well it's, it's all there we might as well do something with it right yeah yeah exactly well it's, it's one of those funny things it's like I, i've had a lot of discussions about this in the past where you know like there's this especially when um like 64-bit like really started to become a common thing but people were still saying like yeah but what really uses it and it's like don't worry that will happen it will you know eventually people will take advantage of that much memory um you just have to wait a little while for it to become practical and this is you know one of those moments where that is very practical like i mean how many laptops these days come with 32 gigabytes of system memory quite a bit and it's not even all that expensive. My Alienware laptop is uh, is 32 gigs, and uh, it's glorious. I can I can do I can do serious work on that while I'm on the road. And yeah, we have a compliment here by uh, Golden Silver. It says uh, I really like the simple interface. I hope it doesn't end up uh, with a ZBrush type avalanche of menus. That I can promise you will not. <laughs> like if there's anything I can very safely say, it will not. The the what we we, we what we really want out of this application is, uh, a, okay, a couple of basic things. Um, we want a powerful application that allows you to add detail without having to understand technical aspects of preparing a surface to allow for adding detail. Um, and we want the application to be discoverable, um, you know, by somebody who doesn't even know anything about 3D. Um, so the features will probably, you know, increase over time. There'll be a lot more capabilities, but we're not going to clutter up the whole interface with new features. And uh, furthermore, as more advanced features show up, we're not going to make you click on 18 different things in menus that are poorly named uh, to get there. Um, so that's, that's something that we really want to emphasize as, as a goal for this application. Uh, really quickly, so the last section that we just went through in this stream, um, uh, what I was doing was I was reaching a point where, especially with this detailing, I was getting a slowdown. But the body of this turtle was all one mesh. The shell was a separate mesh. Uh, but what I was able to do is duplicate that body mesh a couple times, go ahead and erase um, portions of the duplicated meshes and leave behind the head, leave behind the front of the body, leave behind the rear of the body. And so you can see um, on the actual layer tree over here um, that you know I have now multiple layers representing these different parts and it, it increases performance. And actually I kind of didn't expect this, but it made it much easier to work with because from this point forward, now that I have the head in place, uh, once I, I, I can go ahead and turn on all the other elements of the body, it actually made it much easier um, to detail areas like the folds of, of skin on the neck because it was separate. And it's really cool that the way that Canova works is um, other layers that the brush passes over, um, it's constrained to those meshes in the background. So you can see right here as I go over those neck folds, it's all flat, wasn't happy with it, but now I can actually create uh, nice bulbous forms and at times I'll, I'll end up switching over to the sphere brush to kind of create, create the bulging around the neck as it cascades around. Um, so definitely a very cool way to work, definitely a very flexible way to work and we'll definitely have tools in the future that will make it even easier to break those meshes apart into separate pieces. Um, love that flexibility though. Now, in a way, that kind of answers, uh, in a roundabout way, it answers the question that somebody had about repositioning a leg, because you could technically, you know, uh, break out a single arm of uh, of this turtle and delete the rest of it like you did, mm -hmm. and then kind of re reposition it. You would need to yes. resculpt on top of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. You're you're right. But I mean, uh, if you if you break out a leg, see, this is where I mean, this is other future things we are thinking about, obviously. Um, so if you have two legs, right, you sculpted those on a single layer or whole body on a single layer and you had mirror turned on for symmetry while you were sculpting those and then you erase the whole rest of the body, you can't pull those legs apart from each other. 
you could rotate them, you know, um, say for instance around the x-axis so that they tilt further forward or further back, but you can't pull them apart from each other. Um, so that's one of the one of the challenges. We do have some interesting ideas for solutions on that. Um, the things that we would be investigating at a later point in time, um, but ways to separate meshes out and make them connected to each other, even though that they're symmetrical, maybe they're on separate layers, and you can you know position one and not the other, and of course. Uh, being able to Boolean between layers, being able to merge layers together would be hugely, hugely helpful um, in, in, in cases like that. So um, hopefully that, that does emphasize to you that um, issues like this are things that we want to, um, you know, approach in an intelligent manner and make it so that it's not just a hacky way that sort of works for you now, but is a well-implemented um, aspect of the application as a whole. Now, let me just step back here really quickly because I think this is cool. Um, you can see that the shell here is awfully dense. Um, one of the things that I was able to do is I was able to um, just take my ribbon brush, throw its strength all the way down to one, which means it's not going to deform anything or it's not going to add clay, and then make the brush super large and brush over it. And you can see the mesh looks crazy right now. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. Um, but it, it reduced the amount of um, uh, uh, complexity, especially for the remeshing on the surface, uh, which I think is super cool. So I had that stats up there to show the, the difference on it. And I need to restart that. We'll take a look at it again really quickly. And there we go. And so now you can see the separate mesh. And I'm going to go back in and start detailing these scales. And this is just fun. Um, you know, this is something that uh, I, I can't wait until I uh, get to play with the custom brushes a little bit more. Uh, because going in and adding fine details like this with stamp and having some preset nodules. I don't know what these are. These are crazy growths on the skin of, uh, of this creature. It seems like it... Uh, it's like the uh, this uh, the alligator snapping turtle not only was engineered by evolution to just be like a dangerous and terrifying creature, but so that anything that ever looked at it was like that's not going to taste good, you know. It's just disgusting looking. <laughs> like, it's got all these warts all over it. And it's like God knows what those things do. But uh, yeah, so we are thinking about these things and clever ways to do re re repositioning. Um, that is again like so many other things on on our list, but. You know, for now and for, you know, an initial release, uh, like an initial commercial re release of Canova, we want to make sure we have an application that you can sculpt with well. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, from that point forward, start adding functionality that um, increases your capabilities with the application, um, but in an intelligent way that also doesn't create an over bloated nightmare of a, of a program to work with, which uh, kind of high technology applications or new technology applications so oftentimes are, are, are just cumbersome to work with because they're not, they're not well designed. And so we want to have a well designed application. All right, so do we have any other, any other questions there, Ed? Uh, there was one other question about uh, more of a suggestion uh, asking about uh, masking and uh, and a potential gimbal uh, for the layers, I suppose. Yeah, also both uh, very much being talked about. Um, it would it would be nice to have you know some kind of uh, transform handles uh, make things much more precise and easier to work with. Um, so yeah, definitely definitely being those things are being talked about. Okay. And then uh, Thomas Thomas asked, uh, we, we kind of already covered this, uh, but he asked, uh, would it be possible to drop in a temporary rig, position the joints, and then pose instead of using the move tool? Uh, the, yeah, the move tool. Uh, then it remembers the last pose position so we can get different views of the sculpt. Um, so we kind of already covered that, right, Greg? It's, it's sort of. Yeah, um, kind of. I mean, you know, there's a lot of different solutions to an idea like that. The rig thing, I totally hear you on that. Uh, let me just say that uh, I, you're, you're – having the same discussions we are <laughs> like it's uh, I, yeah these are these are things that um, we definitely see the potential of um, but you know when working with a newer technology we need to make sure that this is um, in its early state just well implemented and that's what Ville has done such an amazing job with is creating a, a very solid sculpting application with a newer technology um, that still has certain levels of or a certain type of feel that um, users would already be comfortable with. And so uh, need to take this this snapping turtle further, or and uh, I think it definitely could go further. Um, but uh, this is where he ended off right around SIGGRAPH time, and just as kind of like a test for going in and detailing, this would be, you know, um, the, 
it can handle it. That's what matters. That's, you know, Canova will be able to handle these high levels of detail and probably Bill will even be able to make it more efficient at doing it. Because if you look at the, at the mesh right here, I zoomed in so close while I was doing all those, everything's at the highest level it can possibly go in its current state. And, uh, you know, there's definitely room for even further refinement as time goes on. And so let me go ahead and open up steam. Yeah. And, uh, we have a couple of, uh, Nice comments. Gold and Silver says this looks like so much fun to use, and uh, I think both Greg and I can tell you it's it's awesome. It's it, it is a lot of fun to use. I, I enjoy it equally as much in VR mode as I do in desktop mode uh, for almost different reasons. It's just really fulfilling to when you just create a stroke and you just see the clay kind of appear exactly where you want it to. It's just it's awesome. Yeah, no, I I absolutely love using it in uh, in 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 desktop as well. I mean, you know, it's one of those things where I it just sometimes on a Friday night I'm a nerd and I I like to sit down and watch a movie and sculpt for a while, you know. And uh, it's actually a very comfortable application to sit down and do that. And it doesn't really uh, present much overhead watching a movie stuff like that. Um, so I've been impressed at how well it does on the desktop side, considering you know it really did start off very heavily focused on VR. We did from the beginning say that hey we want to have this be vr and desktop um but it uh um it, it you know it really was vr first so i was kind of apprehensive about that and it's become a very pleasant um experience on the desktop side yeah that, that was actually one of the things that uh, that scared me at first i, I, I was uh, like back when we first started i thought maybe we should even just make it vr only uh, but uh, but as it turns out that having both is uh, is super useful and uh, that's one of the things I like best about it now. Huh? That's interesting. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, <laughs> now I now I know what you were thinking. We were having those. Meetings. <laughs> All right. No, I thought it was very important to uh, uh, to have a desktop side because I mean, you know, that's what people are going to use this 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 you know type of sculpting, VR sculpting. I think it has more than a future, um, but there are so many aspects that need to go further to really make that happen. And, uh, you know, having that desktop side is going to make it much more practical in the, in the short term. And so I am loading up my uh, model here really quickly, and we'll show it to you in just a moment. And so uh, it's in just Jawad, a moment. Yeah. Jawad has asked, um, what about sculpting layers so every detail can be controlled, like a layer transparency in Photoshop? Uh, maybe it's been mentioned previously. Well, I think, Jawad, uh, it depends on what you mean by uh, transparency. Um, just, just like the visibility of it or the... Uh, the strength, could you possibly clarify? Unless, Greg, unless you kind of have an idea of... Uh, uh, yeah, I really don't know, because, yeah, I mean, what is that? Yeah, I don't quite understand what that means. Uh, I'm very curious to hear what, what, he, what he means by that. Um, you know, we'd like to be able to Boolean layers together. Um, that's definitely something that we've, we've talked about, but also not as immediately important for, um, you know, the types of things we want to sculpt. Uh, but anyway, yeah, if you clarify, we'll we'll try and get to that for you. Um, all right, so um, this is the latest release of Canova 1.0 v1 b6, and um, it's awesome. Uh, Vil has done uh, an amazing job again. Uh, we will be releasing this um, either later today or maybe next week. We don't want to commit to that just yet. We got to talk about it after after this webinar. Um, but uh, some big big updates. The list of of um, enhancements. This one is downright into. Uh, between actual feature additions and also uh, uh, bug fixes, things of that sort, and refinements. Um, the biggest thing that you'll notice is that we have this new brushes palette. All the palettes, if uh, you haven't uh, uh, checked out the latest version, the uh, the panels have been moved over um, into separate groups. And so when you open it up, you'll get a default basic arrangement. But you come over to view and panels, and here's all the various tools that you have available. And so we have tools, which are the brushes that you sculpt with, right? But then we also have brushes, and these are your custom brushes. And whenever you work on a layer, like I've got this base head layer, which is this right here, all you have to do is come on over here to save as brush, and it will save that out um, as a brush that you can use. Now, I'm going to go ahead and come on over here. I'm going to drop in my tools so you guys can see a little bit of what is going on here. You can see that I've done a lot of stupid uh, <laughs> tests of this um, recently, but I'll turn on my mirror. You can see custom brush is a new brush option. You can't select that. 
uh, immediately what you have to do is you have to come in here and select your custom brush it'll automatically be enabled and uh, you know you probably want to use stamp and you probably don't want to have smooth blend on for now that may be something that uh, changes over time because we will be playing with this um, the height feature that we added a few versions ago is very useful in this case um, I already know the settings that I want for this nose because I was preparing this somewhat as a as a as a demo that works you know pretty pretty reasonably fast and I know my height I want it to be around 30 and so if I come on over here and I can actually see the lining up. This is something that we want to improve upon is making, dealing with the, um, applying something in the center easier. Um, but I know I want to move it down right and around here and I'll drop that into place. And you can see that I have my nose in place there, which is super, super cool. Now, I think the height actually needed to be higher. So I'll go on up to 40 instead. I had just undid that and I'll drop that nose in place. Okay, so much better. And you can see how it actually aligned that. I'm starting to get the nostrils. And then I can come on over here to the lips. And uh, if I go ahead and try and line this up reasonably well, I think that's about right, and drop that into place. Nope, got to change that. It's supposed to be 50. And I'll bring that height down to, I believe it was negative five in this case. Um, but there's a lot of controls that um, you can use to be able to decide how this custom brush will align with your surface and how it'll connect. Okay, so that's a giant pair of lips, um, but that's fine because it, it does just kind of satisfy the need of uh, kind of showing you guys this. And this is all in the same layer. It's completely joined. If I go ahead and turn the wireframe on, and turn on follow camera for my light so it cascades over the surface so you can see it a little bit better. You can see how intelligently it's even decided like, um, this is not what the original mesh I sculpted looked like. It didn't have this low res here. It's very intelligently decided where it needs to get rid of it and where it needs to add it. And if I hold down the shift key, now I can go ahead and smooth on top of that, turn my stamp off and turn my wireframe off. And I can just blend that into place and you know get that bridge of the nose to uh, start blending into the area around it. And uh, one of the ones I was working on just before I uh, um, hopped in on this webinar was a pair of eyes to have those align. And I'm going to open that file up to show that to you. But that is cool. I think that is great. This is usable in VR, of course, um, which I think being able to determine proportions um, with preset meshes would be hugely awesome um, in VR if you have a whole bunch of preset meshes. And we do want to talk to you guys about um, anything that you guys can create in Canova um, that you want to supply as brushes. We would love to get some custom brushes from you folks. And so I'm going to discard this and I'm gonna open up this eye mesh and Dino uh, Zenko played around with this a lot initially, which is the idea of bringing meshes in um, from your 3D application as an OBJ um, and then having that in the background, as you can see here, and then sculpting over them. And so what I did was grab the ribbon brush I'm able to bring the height down to, say, for instance, negative 40, make that a little bit on the smaller side, and let's make sure I've got my actual correct layer selected. And then I can see stroke on top of this and you can kind of figure out um, what depth you want to really have that um, fall beneath the surface. And it does an incredibly good job of refining those forms. Now, the smaller it is, the better it is. And what Dino was showing actually um, was how well this works when you're using a small brush and you stroke over that surface. And so reproducing these forms by using external meshes that you just kind of copy. And uh, so this is a short term solution to kit bashing so that we can get meshes into Canova very quickly and, uh, and start utilizing this kind of stuff. And I have mirror on, which I really didn't want to, but you can see this, this is like five minutes of effort just trying to get it to capture. And then you go in on top of that and turn that mirror off and you know refine that a little bit, save it out as a brush it, over here. And then you're able to stamp it right onto the surface. And so as the custom brushes continue to develop over time, um, I think this is going to make it extremely easy for people to produce really high quality work really easily. Uh, one thing I'm looking forward to, any sort of quadruped, quadruped foot or paw, I hate making those. <laughs> I really hate it. Uh, so, um, you know, having stuff like that, you can just slap right in that's relatively accurate and then go in and refine on top of is, uh, it's just going to make it easier. So hopefully that's, uh, that, um, helps, 
um, explain to you guys what we're thinking and that we are moving in a direction that I think is probably more or less aligned with the stuff that you want. Um, Ed and I both are artists. Bill is, in, you know, like just a genius and an enthusiast of this technology. And, uh, and I so say I'm, I'm a non-artist. <laughs> oh, okay. you did some, you did some pretty decent stuff. And uh, like, we've been, like, I, I think so, you know, like even, uh, uh, yeah, I was actually, I was actually a little bit, uh, and I don't know what the word is. Like, I was like, oh wow, like I know Bill's not a sculptor, and when, when you yeah. do that, that that head, I was like, like, am I, am I that good? Do I have any skills? Like, <laughs> I was, like, I was uh, Bill, you're causing everybody insecurity. And it's yeah, like, I mean, like yeah. Lukash Pizarro. Lukash Pizarro helped us with this for a while. He did some design work for us. Great guy, and uh, he's not much of a sculptor. He's asked me to make models for him for ACS kit and stuff like that, and always like, I don't know how to do sculpting at all. And he made a, a couple models in Canova that were like, wow, you're a liar. <laughs> like, you actually are a pretty good sculptor. And there's one thing for sure. Ed and I both can't even approach any of the stuff that you do, uh, Bill. So, so there's that in the comparison for sure. Um, but yeah, we're all, we're all super excited about this technology, where it can go. And uh, if you guys can help, make, help us make some custom brushes, that'll uh, you know, help us get... Um, more of the features that more people want even sooner because, you know, we can grow this piece of software into something that, you know, people aren't just curious about, but, you know, you wake up in the morning and you're like, this tool is going to help me get my job done quicker than anything else. And that is our ultimate goal. We want to make a tool that is going to make your lives easier and that you enjoy using. All right, so um, that pretty much closes it up. Uh, if you guys have more questions, this will be posted. Feel free to ask questions. Um, I'll try and keep my eye on, on it. Um, and thank you for Pixel Fondue for hosting these. They're absolutely amazing. Ed, you're incredible for helping out with these every time we have one. And Bill, thank you so much uh, for hopping on with us uh, today. It was, it was really cool hearing your insights and this experience. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we got we to gotta have you on, on here more often. I, I think that uh, the people who are watching this probably agree. Tell us if you agree. That matters. <laughs> All right. So thanks yeah. so much, folks. And uh, yeah, we'll let you get back to your, your life. It's late for Bill right now. It's like, what, 920? Uh, yeah, that's right. Oh, boy. All right. Let you get back to your, your family. All right. So thanks so much again, everybody. Have a great day and uh, looking forward to our next one. And we will have a new build out, like I said, either today later today or maybe next week but uh we'll try and get something out to you guys as soon as possible it is this is a beta feature in a beta version of the software just to clarify we want you guys to get want to get it in your hands though so um thanks again and have a great day later